Uh, hello everybody and welcome to amanda.ie. I am joined today by uh, four fantastic women uh, who I admire greatly. Uh, they are Elaine Quarry, Rachel Powell, Linda Irvine and Eileen Weir. So uh, we're going to be talking as part of my uh, interview series about media representation and the role of women uh, in society. I'm going to let the women introduce themselves because they'll be better at doing it than I am. So if we start maybe with you, uh, Elaine, and we'll work our way around. Um, just a few opening remarks, please. Hello, um, my name is Elaine Quarry. I work at the Women's Resource and Development Agency, or WRDA, along with Rachel. Um, my work involves both peace building, community relations work, and also um, work against sexual harassment and sexual violence. So these are the kinds of uh, topics, peace building and sexual violence, that I would present as an expert in. Thank you for that. And we'll move to Rachel next, please. Hi, uh, my name is Rachel Powell. I'm the women's sector lobbyist with WRDA and I work along with Elaine. Um, so I work as the lobbyist and that involves trying to influence um, all levels of policy being implemented in Northern Ireland through ensuring that women's voices are heard and that they have their say in different forms of legislation. So it's very broad. It basically is any form of legislation. We look at how it impacts women. So that can include domestic sexual violence, Brexit, economic issues and more. Um, I am also the chair of the Women's Policy Group for Northern Ireland, and um, this is just a coalition of women from across 30 different organisations um, here who are experts in different areas of policy, and we come together to do collaborative work in. And we'll move next to Linda, please. Hi, my name is Linda Irvine, and I manage the Tourist Project in East Belfast. It's, it's an Irish language project, which has grown, oh my goodness, massively over the last 10 years. And just provides classes and um, history and all sorts of things for, for people within the East Belfast area and beyond. I'm also on the committee of Nisgong Shota, which is a new, just about to open, first of its kind, integrated Irish medium preschool in East Belfast. And we'll go last but very not uh, least, uh, Eileen Weir, please. Hello, my name is Eileen Weir. I coordinate Greater North Belfast Women's Network. I uh, work right across North and West Belfast and beyond. Uh, most of my work is working with women to uh, build relationships with women from a different community background, whatever that may be. Uh, I also do personal development program that tackles the, the, the issue of the mental health that women are actually uh, being left to, to, to hold on to the family purse springs uh, in very difficult situations, which creates uh, mental illness uh, of some shape or form. Uh, so really, it's a bit like hands on uh, at, at the grassroots level. Uh, and it, 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 the women that I work with inspire me to can continue doing the work that I do. And um, thank you very much, everybody. I've often sort of described Northern Ireland to people who don't know it or the North of Ireland. I've said in all these videos, I'm easy about what people call it. It's, I, I wasn't uh, in charge of uh, partitioning Ireland or creating the formation of Northern Ireland. So I'm easy about what uh, people say or how they describe it. Um, it feels like a very male place, even now, and, and in comparison to other parts of the UK um, and the rest of Ireland, not saying that they're, you know, paradise or that they're perfect or anything like that, but there's certainly a, a unique uh, set of challenges challenges here and it does feel as if the role of women is is consistently minimized and diminished and it's a real a real struggle if if you were trying to we'll start with you Eileen if you were describing here to people how would you describe the society that we exist in and thrive in or don't for, for well something? women do all the work and men get all the praise uh, I, I I think that would be a first statement uh, because women have been working uh, at grassroots level uh, for over 30 odd years. You know, you just have to take the history of the of the centres, the women's centres across Northern Ireland. You know, I mean, 14 of them, you know, were going into their 37th, 35th year. So long before the Good Friday Agreement, women were actually very actively involved in the issues that affected women during that horrific time. Uh, within our communities. 
but it seems, you know, all these years on, we're not the ones at the table. It's the men at the table who, who actually, uh, in, in some shape or form, are maybe in, in involved in the conflict. And, and, and it's not about not having their voices heard, because I think everybody's voice needs to be heard. But in particular, women need to be heard as well. And we're not getting that opportunity. OK. And what about you, Linda? How, how do you describe this phase to people? Yeah, and I would agree very much with what Eileen says. I mean, we know that, um, you know, there have been and there are today, you know, some women in leadership roles within the, 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 the political sector, but they're very much underrepresented. And I personally feel this is not to diminish, you know, some of the men who are doing some fantastic work, but I feel if, you know, there was a higher percentage of women involved in politics, then we might be in a better place. We might be in a different place. I would hope so anyway. Um, I also feel sadly, you know, if, if we're going to describe the society that we live in, it's, 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 it's depressing that, you know, 20 odd years after the Good Friday Agreement, we are still living in what is a very segregated and divided community. And, um, and I think that has to change. And, you know, the way our politics is set up, the way our education system is set up, the way our housing is set up, everything around us is about segregation and yet we're pouring millions and millions into this place to bring people together you know what about you Rachel yeah I would definitely agree with what's been said I think for Northern Ireland it's very much a place where there's tiny minorities on issues who are very vocal who seem to get way more said than any other group so often here we're being painted as this really divided society, but the majority of people here don't want that. The majority of people here just get on with things. <laughs> but we have um, some very loud minorities uh, who very much get the shaped narratives that doesn't necessarily reflect here as a place. I think as well, because we are, you know, post-conflict society and there's so much segregation, um, like what both Eileen and Linda just described, it makes it really difficult to talk about gender because everything is painted in the terms of the two communities or the two main communities and anytime anything after that kind of gets lost or deprioritized because it doesn't have the same political force really or it's not as newsworthy almost um so I, I find it really challenging that we live in a society where um because gender has been deprioritized we have some of the the most stark uh reflections of gender inequality here we're so far behind in almost everything yet it's barely spoken about and i i think that because Northern Ireland is perceived as this really divided society, which I would say is tensionally segregated, um, other people from outside of here are afraid to talk about it. So I find it absolutely infuriating watching other groups across the rest of the UK or Ireland talk about gender equality and women's issues. And they're, it's like they're afraid to touch Northern Ireland, um, even though often what they're describing is much worse here. So definitely somewhere where it's easier to get a platform if you're talking about very divisive issues, but when you're working with amazing women across community groups, it's, it's very hard to be heard despite the crucial importance of what we're campaigning on. And despite the fact that it benefits all women, um, not just certain communities. Thank you, and, and uh, Elaine? Um, I agree with everything everyone said, but I want to go, just build on what Rachel was saying just a moment ago. Um, so it is so difficult to talk about anything that's not the two communities related. And then you have the issue of if you do manage to get a word in edgewise and you do manage to articulate some of the issues that we're facing because we're women or gender minorities generally um you're immediately put back in your place so to speak you know you, you face a backlash that is disproportionate to what you've said and that is often very personalized sometimes a little frightening and um it it serves to reinforce that no this is not an appropriate topic for the public arena we decide what's an appropriate topic and the appropriate topics are things that could fall neatly into a green or an orange uh, box. And like Rachel was saying, and like everybody's work shows, um, we actually do does a great deal more cross community working. Does a does a whole community that don't fit neatly into either box um, a number of communities, in fact, and it doesn't the, the public narrative doesn't really reflect the reality on the ground, in my experience. and that's on purpose you know it's deliberately to keep out those voices that are pushing for progress i suppose to some degree it's it serves maybe some people's interests to make sure that the conversation doesn't move on and um, but the people whose interests it definitely doesn't serve are women and that's women of all backgrounds um 
because getting getting a basic conversation about about a basic um, gender equality issue is immediately uh, deemed divisive because it doesn't fit that agenda. OK, um, and, then, and then we'll start we'll start with you again on this one, then about the role that the media has in this, because, you know, working as a journalist, um, you know, I, I've been working here for, as a journalist for over 10 years and I like to think I'm, I'm trying to do a decent job and give, give everybody a fair shout. I get that there are challenges, there are resources, there's a series of challenges, resources and so on. But what would your take be on what the media landscape is like in this part of the world uh, and what your engagement with the media has been like? There are people who, like yourself and others I could mention, and, and that I'm sure that we're all thinking of as well, who, who go out of their way to elevate those voices and to try and put them at the center of the agendas. But then you've got two problems coming out of that. Number one, those people themselves get abused for what they're doing. But number two, it is then put aside as this is an issue for a specific subset of interests. You know, this is an, a special interest issue. This is not a, a main topic of the day. The, the people who often, um, and, and there are exceptions again, but the people who, who dominate our, our, either our print media or our airwaves tend overwhelmingly to leave those kinds of issues to one side or to barely mention them. And then if you do get a hearing on one of those um, large media platforms, very often you're again subject to, um, you, because you become more visible for that hour or half hour that you're on the radio or on the TV or, whatever it happens to be you're again opened up for the kind of abuse that is sort of normalized in our public arena um where i, I mean for i i myself have been on um a large uh current affairs uh tv show let's say twice and um on at least one of those occasions after i came off air and before i even got back uh, into a taxi to go home the amount of personalized abuse i had that related sort of to what i had said but was primarily focused on my appearance, my voice, my teeth, my hair, my shirt, everything. Um, so you get that following you around, which leads to a reluctance to actually engage. So it's a sort of a self-perpetuating cycle, really. Um, and also there, behind all of that is narrative of like, what does this have to do? There aren't there more important things going on. What does this have to do with the issues of the day? You're on here pushing an agenda. And that's such a common phrase that I hear again and again. You go on to talk about the things you're expert in, the things you care about, the things you work on day to day, and you get told you're pushing an agenda because it's simply not of interest to a section of the audience. And that's, again, down to the segregation of women's issues. Rachel? Yeah, I think uh, media engagement, like in my role as women's sector lobbyist, I get quite a lot of media requests and, and ask to engage on different topics, but I find it incredibly daunting. I have got to the point now where my experience with media engagement has made me stop ever wanting to engage with media. Um, anytime that I have, I, every single time I perceive abuse afterwards um, for just doing my job. And, and I don't know why that is an okay thing to do where you know I'm working and trying to highlight the issues that are important to women. And that opens me up to a whole range of attacks based on my appearance, my gender, my figure, where I'm from, being working class, being disabled, whatever it may be. Um, I have had abuse about all of these issues, so I find it incredibly difficult engaging with media, um, and I think it's because of my past experiences that I feel like that. But I also find with um, issues that disproportionately impact women, when we're trying to raise these issues, a lot of the time, the majority of media, media outlets just aren't interested. Um, but you will see some like controversial figures from Twitter tweet something they know not really anything about, and suddenly there will be 10 news articles about it. Um, and then we find where there's topics that are considered divisive, you know, like Brexit. And we're trying to talk about how across the board, all women, regardless of what way they voted in Brexit, are concerned about their maternity rights or their workers' rights or whatever it may be. And the media has zero interest in that. Instead, they want to just blow up other things out of proportion um, about men's narratives and how that is different to ours. And I find the most frustrating thing out of all of it is a lot of the time when we're working on issues to do with gender inequality, particularly issues to do with domestic and sexual violence. There's always this attempt to have the other side. Um, so we recently you know, submitted so much evidence on a number of different bills in the assembly to do with domestic violence, stalking, um, currently stuff now on the justice bill, non-fatal strangulation, a whole range of different things like hate crime and all of it. And we presented so much evidence about what women were saying had happened to them in abusive relationships. 
And the media only wanted us on if we would let other groups who thought they should be allowed to catcall and like grab women and how we were getting out of control about not letting men express their views on, on domestic violence against women. There doesn't always have to be another side. Sometimes you can't just say something is bad and acknowledge that. But we don't get the space to do that because our society is so used to having, well, this is one side and that's the other. Even on a thing that you should unanimously be able to say, domestic violence and coercive control is wrong and it's a problem that impacts women. We can't have that because of how divided um, our society is and how the media portrays that. They don't want us on unless there's someone to say something the complete opposite of us. And quite often you will have people in our roles who are experts in these areas going up against people with just dodgy opinions about it. And it totally undermines us. And then we're undermined afterwards about how we're not experts and all these different people who read an article once. It's just so demeaning that you spend so much time in these roles working for charities. And that's what you're subjected to when you try to talk about women's issues in the media. And that's just women more generally. Anytime I've tried to talk about being a disabled woman and the issues that has, it is much worse. The abuse I get is much, much, much worse um, because of those intersecting identities. Right. So this is hard to listen to as a journalist, but I think it's an important conversation to be having because we can identify where we can do better and maybe we'll we'll move in, in the next part of our conversation uh, on, on to trying to find some solutions to this because so often you hear about, you know, oh, women don't want to or we try to contact women and they're never enough or they say no, but there's obviously a reason why that's happening. Um, Linda, what's your experience then of, of the media? Because obviously because you are someone... Um, from a sort of Protestant unionist background who's engaged in, in uh, being an Irish language champion that presents uh, some problems for, for people with regard to you uh, and you experience sectarianism and people misrepresenting you and misinformation. I'm sure everybody on this panel has had that at, at one point or another. Do you, you must have some good experiences and also the negative. We're here to listen to, to all of it. Yeah, well, I, I've had mixed experiences with the media, and obviously um, I see the media as something very separate to social media. And with the media, you know, we, I suppose in many ways, we have usually been a good news story, and we've had quite a lot of coverage, and that, that's been great. But I think one of the things I do find frustrating is, you know, there's certain things that we do, and we send out press releases, and we get no interest at all, and we feel that they're they're very newsworthy and in fact sometimes more newsworthy than some of the things the media have covered but for whatever reason maybe it's not a slow news week I don't know but we don't even get a you know a nibble never mind a bite mm -hmm. and also then you know like I, I'm sure all the women here you know doing media stuff is quite stressful because you're really putting yourself out there and you're opening yourself up to attack and all the rest of it and, and I get, you know, the media have a certain job to do, but you, you put a lot of work into it and, you know, you turn up where they want you, when they want you, all the rest of it. I mean, I've had many situations where I've come out of my house at 10 o'clock at night to go and do a programme where it's, no, you're okay, we don't want you anymore because, you know, something bigger has come on. And that, that's fair enough. I understand that's how the media works. Um, you know, but it's, it's 30 seconds on something which is really just meaningless and pointless, to be honest that you have then given a lot of time to and a lot of effort to and sometimes a lot of thought to. Um, also, you know, I've been in situations where the media have ran stories about me and the headline is an absolute contradiction of the story. And I know lots of people only read the headline and I've kind of went, oh my goodness. Now, when you read the story, the story's fine and the story's factual. The headline is absolutely misleading. So there's things like that that um, you know, they cause me problems because that's what people think. And, you know, that works in with the sort of sensationalist nature of the media, but it doesn't work, you know, for the people who are actually trying to do the job on the ground. And I, I think the media, you know, they, they have a responsibility and I don't think they always are responsible. I think they, they just often think about selling newspapers, you know, getting our time, whatever it is, and it has to be bigger than that. And you separate out then sort of the media and social media is two different things, even though social media is becoming one of the arenas where people consume information like in a sort of, you know, not not everybody buys a paper anymore or listens to radio or watches TV, but quite a lot of people are online as well. But you see them as kind of different things. Well, I do. And, that um, you know, I know a lot of people sort of go to their news for social media. But for me, social media is a very useful tool where, you know, because I, I can't rely on 
newspapers, um, TV, radio, to actually promote what I do. You know, I get a chance every so often if there's a particular story they like, but I have no control over how they put that across. But I can do that for myself and my organization. You know, we can promote ourselves. Um, again, the problem about that, and it's just one of those issues that everybody has on social media, is that, you know, people, I believe people treat social media like they do when they're sitting in their cars. You know, they, they can shout and rant and rave and they don't realize that other people are listening to them. And it's a tough place to be sometimes when you're on the end of that, because I think because people think you're in the public eye, um, you know, and these are jobs that we do. And this is just part of our job. But they think that that's OK. They abuse you, they insult you, they tell lies about you, they misrepresent you. And if it was done on them, you know, they would be the first to sort of stick their hands up and say, oh, my goodness, this isn't acceptable. But as I say, it seems to be that, you know, if your job has been in the public eye, then, then you're fair game and you're not. OK. Eileen? Yeah, yeah, I'm not going to go over everything that the other three have done because I, I agree with with everything that's been done. You know, my own personal experience with, with, with media over the years, I have to say a bit like Linda, you know, some of it has been very, very good. Uh, and again, you know, it, it comes across very well, but then you're not talking about anything that's controversial when it's good. But when you're talking about something controversial, it turns very, very uh, better, uh, especially headlines, as Linda has said, because uh, when I won uh, an award a couple of years ago, you know, it was UDA woman. That had nothing to do with the award that, that I won. Uh, and it's a misrepresentation. Uh, and the thing, too, that I don't think that a lot of people understand is when we speak, we're not speaking personally. We're, we're, we're speaking on behalf of people who we represent. And that's not all women. I have to say it's only the women that we are working with, which is many right across this whole province. And, you know, it's a personal attack on something that you're translating on what you have been working on, you know, for, for years. And, and this is the experiences that you're getting and what you're hearing people saying. But when it comes to media, it's attack on the individual. It's They're not taking into account that this individual is talking on behalf of many. Uh, that we have came across and we're hearing, I, you know, part of my job is, is dialogues, information sessions, you know, uh, and, and bringing news into the network so they can spread it out among the women. And then I get feedback and we do consultations with a lot of the stuff that Rachel's been talking about, about lobbying. We, we're involved in all those consultations, some shape or form. So our information is coming and it's coming from the, the, the good place of this is what women that we're working with are saying. Now, you know, there only seems to be a democratic society when it's the minority that's talking. But when we're speaking, and we can speak for probably a majority, uh, when we take in the whole women's movement into this, we're speaking for a majority of, of, of people who are, are saying this and thinking this. And it just was translated in, 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 a, in a way through social media, I would say, would be the worst because, you know, I, we've all been attacked in some shape and form. But the last time that I was attacked on social media, I had a genuine fear of my life, of, of something happening to me. That's not a nice place to be. You know, you have to sort of go off the radar. So... I'm not representing the women that I'm working with. If I'm, I mean, part of the networks that were set up that I work with were set up for the fear of women being able to talk out in their own community. So it was a conduit to make sure that everybody's voice would be heard and nobody would be left out. And to me, that's a democratic society. But when we say that, we're not part of the democracy. It's yeah, only yeah. the certain minority is part of this democracy. And this minority want to have democracy, 
But when it comes to listening to other people, democracy goes out the window. I was so, going to say, Eileen, that like all, all four of you have experienced some pretty serious uh, online abuse in particular uh, in recent times. Like what, like does that manifest itself as misogyny, sectarianism, ageism, disabledism, uh, you know, being from the other side of the border? Um, you know, what, what way does it manifest itself and what toll does that take on you as individuals? And like it is obviously designed to, to try and silence women. I mean, we, I mean, within the work that, that I do, and I can only speak on myself on behalf of the women that I sort of way would represent on anything that I would do within within the media, uh, you, you, you know, it presents not only, it stops me from, well, I mean, I have to be very, very careful anyway, because if I'm doing work uh, with, with a group of women from across the communities, which I would prefer to say, because I don't want to put anybody, any labels on anybody, because I think labels create a, 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 a separation as well. So when I'm working with the women from across the communities, which is Indian community as well, Chinese community and, and people who are settled here from different parts of Europe, you know, I have to be very careful what I put on social media. I cannot say some of the things that I'm doing freely on social media because I could be putting them women's lives at risk if they're getting involved in, and, and you know, let's say I, I do a lot of work with the, with the, the Bloody Sunday Trust and, and, and some of the women who, who would do that work along with me, I couldn't put that on social media because them women, they become targets for working with the Bloody Sunday Trust. But we're working with Bloody Sunday Trust to look at the dairy model for a better way of life and in, in, in what why it be parades, why it be flags, why it be so we're 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 looking, we're experimenting with different areas to see if we could make things better in the areas that we come from. But it's very, very hard to do that when there's that threat. Uh, and it means our our work that we're doing, the fantastic work that all here are doing and, and beyond here uh, sort of way is under the radar and we hadn't to do nothing under the radar. The last time we done things under the radar it was prior to the Good Friday Agreement. So we're still working under the radar and a lot of the evidence and a lot of stuff that we're doing will never get our time. We'll never because of that fear of social media. That's interesting and I'm, I'm worrying, Eileen, that that's something that you're talking about that's happening in 2021. Um, Linda, what about you? What What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, no, I feel, I mean, my own personal self, I, I have been attacked numerous times on social media and I find it interesting that, you know, I, I look at different women that are attacked and the, the trolls tend to pick on certain things. So with me, it's, um, I'm in it for the money. That's right, your driveway is paying for diamonds and that's what I heard. Absolutely, they don't see the car I drive. Um, you know, um, I'm in Sinn Féin or I'm supporting Sinn Féin or, you know, I was even said one time I was going with somebody out of Sinn Féin. My husband was quite amused. He wondered where I got the time, you know. But it's these sorts of things. And what it's about, it's to undermine you. It's to undermine your message. And of course, they're just out and out lies. And I find that very difficult, but I also recognize that they do it because they don't actually have a real argument. And if you have to base your arguments on, on truths, then, you know, you, you really don't have any, any argument. Um, recently, the, the, the problems we've had around setting up an integrated Irish media in school have been particularly sad because, you know, this is something very positive. It's something very groundbreaking. But a social media campaign has been used to, you know, to sort of intimidate and move us on. And that even has went into um, posters being put up around um, the where, where we'd hoped to have the, the knee skull posters of me. Um, so that was very threatening. And at that stage, I had to get the police involved in that. But, you know, I think the saddest thing of all was last Saturday, you know, we had a get together for the parents. Parents had never met each other before and we, we had never met most of them in person. They just registered their children. So we had a fun day and it was brilliant and we took a big group photograph. And we would love to be able to do the things that all these schools do or all preschools do. We would have loved to put up a photograph of the children playing and the parents together. And we can't do that, you know. 
So that's that's where we are with small three year olds. You know, we have to protect our parents and our children because there are a very, very small minority of people in this country who are still living in the 1980s and don't want us to be in 2021. It's kind of the story of this place, though, that it's always been a minority of people that have ruined things for, for everybody else. But uh, Rachel, could you talk to us a little bit about this and also about it seems as if sometimes abuse can be, you know, it can be so disruptive and, and hurtful, but it, it may not necessarily meet a criminal threshold or it may, you know, it may be libel, it may be defamation, but there is no sort of civil remedy uh, for people because who, of, of who it is that's engaged, whether, uh, you know, they're a person of straw, or whether they're anonymous or whatever. Like, well, what's your experience then of online on, on the, of the toll that it takes on you? Yeah, so I think I'll touch on the last part of that first, Amanda. So. Yeah. I get online abuse weekly on a weekly, like, almost on a weekly basis, I would say almost on a daily basis. Um, and a lot of the stuff that's being said to me, you know, it's being done by anonymous accounts or troll accounts or um, a lot of insinuation about different things, trying to undermine what it is I'm speaking about. But a lot of the things that have been said, had that happened to someone in a position of power, it wouldn't have been tolerated. And you see people in media who are able to sue for libel or, you know, different politicians who are able to do that as well for defamation we work for a charity, like, where are we going to be able to get the resources to do that and protect ourselves? We just simply don't have it. And we have to just get on with it and accept that there's nothing that can be done. And one thing that I find about the impact of all of this, so the common theme is always gender. I think no matter what, there's always something about gender. And what I find about this sort of online abuse is they will then find anything they can about you to tack onto that, to undermine you further. So I have been told, how dare I speak for, for, Protestant unionists and loyalist communities um, as a PUL woman. And I was like, well, I'm actually not a PUL woman. Oh, right. Well, then she's from the border in South Armagh. She's clearly a terrorist involved in the IRA. That's not true either. Then, um, you know, being told, oh, who's she to talk about disability? She looks fine. Um, then I tell what conditions I have. Oh, which is obviously just faking because she's a scrounger. You know, it's always to undermine. Then it'll be like, um, oh, you know, typical middle class thinking they know about these issues. And then I explain, actually, I'm working class. Well, then that must mean you're stupid. You know, it, it just always, whatever it is, they tack it on and use it as a new way to undermine uh, what it is that you're doing. But gender is always the common theme across this. And often when you're talking about issues that disproportionately impact gender, like I remember during um, the repeal campaign, and I very much tried to share, you know, some of my perspective as a disabled woman who was on, you know, such heavy doses of medication and the impact that had on my access to reproductive health care. And the answer from a load of men was, um, well, you should be banned from having sex for the rest of your life or who would even want you anyway because you're disabled or, you know, just horrendous things about trying to talk about an issue that specifically impacts disabled women in a unique way. And it's just twisted and tried to use against you as a way to undermine you. And the impact it's had on me years ago, whenever I was um, a student officer before I worked in this role, you know, it was an elected role in my student's union and I found it really, really tough when I was getting so much abuse to the point that the police would have to come in and check in and let us know about, you know, different threats and things that were going on. And, you know, I found that really challenging. I went back to do my postgrad after a few years of being seriously ill from my disabilities to have to then try and improve things from people who are in backgrounds like me to then be told that I had to almost expect that level of abuse because how dare I be a woman with these different backgrounds and talk about these things. And it's got to the point now in my role as lobbyist, I only ever talk to the media when it's in relation to things that I have research data and facts to back it up. I've got to the point where I don't even share my own opinion on things anymore because it just opens up to abuse and I, I just can't do it no more. I'm sick of it. Like I have enough going on to manage. And this is how women get marginalized. You make it so difficult for them to speak. You use their personal experiences against them. You use their lived experience against them and you undermine them to the point that they just can't do it no more. And like we are trying to improve the lives of people and we're talking about heavy topics and we've had so many women come to us and tell us their stories and then they see how it's perceived in the media like i don't blame women for not wanting to engage like we have all these anonymous testimonies that we share and we keep them anonymous for a reason because they can't tell their stories openly about paramilitaries threatening them um, and other horrific stories of abuse because it just gets worse so i think it's a long-winded answer, Amanda, but I think that we have the least access to justice when it comes to these things, but face the highest amount of abuse for simply trying to improve things for women. Okay, and Elaine? Yeah, yeah, everything that's been said, but also I would like to add to what Rachel's saying. I get similarly uh, abuse almost on a daily basis, um, and certainly on a weekly basis. And 
it varies depending on the circumstances because like Rachel said, they're very adaptable. So, you know, they'll say something and if it turns out not to be true, they'll turn around and use it in the opposite way against you. The point is to undermine your credibility. It's not to actually engage with what you're saying. It's to say, how dare you say anything in the first place? And the, the goal is to stop you talking. Now, I'm a naturally contrary person. I was born this way. I don't mind being contrary and I am getting quite good at you know, shoving it down. I've I've never felt unsafe in my bodily integrity, which is um lucky, I guess. Um, it's maybe down to circumstances. Um, but I have often felt, you know, upset, emotionally upset by the kind of abuse I get. But I'm very good at putting it in a box and putting it to one side and keeping on going. It hasn't changed the kind of way I work. But that frustrates me even more because we're trying to create a society in which women after us can do this. Um, and I've already noticed I, I'm extremely wary about what I will let my children see um, about what I do publicly. Um, they are still primary school age children. They're too young for social media yet. But I would never tell them when I'm getting this kind of, of abuse. I would never even um, let them see anything. There are times when I've been on on TV, for example, or on the radio, where you get somebody who's particularly aggressive and I won't let them see or hear that. Even though I, I would speak to them about the nature of the kind of work I do, I would keep that off to one side because I don't want them to be scared of speaking up. Um, and I don't want every young woman to have to develop a, quick, a really thick hide and a really high endurance level for abuse. That's what we're trying to change. And I think that is what makes people so angry. They don't want a future in which young women middle-aged women and older women can speak openly without <clears throat> being intimidated easily. Um, so it, it frustrates me that, that we have to do that, that we have to take all of this abuse in order to try and achieve that. But I know that it's the sort of, in a way, lasting of a dying wasp that wants to hold on to that lovely patriarchal society they had 50 years ago where women didn't speak out unless they were turning up to stand behind men. Things have changed and things are changing. And on the ground, and we know things are changing because these women and, and the society in general is moving on. And the people who want don't want it to move on are angry that it's moving on and we're convenient scapegoats. Um, so I'm prepared to take some of that nonsense because it might create a better future, but it frustrates me that we have to do that. Okay. And what do you think we can do to make things better is it just a question of keeping going um is 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 that you know all that it's going to take is it going to require um you know society or the media or, or to make conscious decisions about how we cover things and what we cover like have, have you any solutions on how we can make it better and back to you Elaine you've your hand up already so you can start <laughs> so this actually falls neatly into some of the work that I, I do already because we do work on how the media reports um, stories of sexual and domestic violence and how that influences the public narrative on these things. And one of them fits neatly into what Linda said, and I know that we've all experienced headlines that totally misrepresent a story. Um, they're frustrating when you're the subject of them, but they're also damaging to sort of the public awareness on these issues. Because like Linda said, most people don't read much past the headline or unless there's a little bold bit underneath with a few bullet points, they might read that. Not an awful lot of people people are sitting down to read deep analysis and um, those who are already not likely to be the ones meeting out abuse, you know. So one thing would be an improvement on the kind of standards of the way um, headlines and this particularly goes for um, print media and online media um, of the online versions of print media publications, if you will, um, improvement in the way headlines actually reflect the stories so that they're not sensationalized and are not uh, designed to, um, for the maximum number of clicks, the lowest common denominator, cheap versions of the story. Uh, number two would be moderation of comments online. If you write a news story um, and publish it online, um, the comments must either be moderated or left if they, if they cannot be moderated because that's a huge job then they they should be turned off and um, particularly on sensitive stories i can understand that there are stories where it's it's not going to be controversial but there's many where they can tell in advance it's going to be and they need to put aside the resources to monitor that properly but for the safety of the subjects of the story and in the case of, of say for example ongoing criminal trials people being named when they shouldn't be named for example 
um, that happens in the comments and although it can be removed later, the damage can be done by then. Um, and the one last thing I would say is, Rachel touched on it before, that balance thing. We need to get rid of this false notion that if you have somebody on talking about, you know, say the harms of, of sexual violence, you do not need to have somebody on saying these people are making a big deal of it. That is not balance. Um, and some outlets have been doing a really good job recently. And I've had a few discussions on Talkback, for example, where there's been a really, really good approach taken where it's I will have two or three experts in this field on and I will talk to them and gather their views. People can phone in as they always do, but that goes through a moderation process before it reaches the air. They aren't getting somebody on from Spike or whatever to argue that, you know, Me Too is made up out of nothing. You know, it's the statistics are nowhere near as bad as they look or some nonsense like that, which then don't, totally takes away from the in-depth thing and puts it on a defensive kind of footing. Um, so yes, that getting rid of that notion of balance where there doesn't need to be balance and hearing from experts and giving them the time and the space to talk about what they know. Okay, Rachel? Yeah, so everything that Elaine said, but also <laughs> I, I just think that we need to be able to call out misogyny for what it is. It's a word that's barely ushered uh, in Northern Ireland. And it's just, it's so disappointing because every time we talk about something and how this is a society-wide issue and this contempt against women and bias and prejudice towards women, it's always, what about men? <laughs> and we're like, yes, okay, there are men that deal with these issues too. And we're not saying that that isn't true. What we're saying is when something is a disproportionately gendered issue, we need to be able to call a spade a spade and call it out for what it is. And I think that's one of the very first things that we need to do. And that even for our work, when we were trying to get violence against women and girls strategy, we were being told constantly, no, that would undermine male victims. How would that undermine male victims? I just don't get it. We're the only part of the UK and Ireland without one. And it's such a huge issue here um, that we just need to be able to call these things out like it would with any other group. But we're in this society where it's almost like, you know, um, misery loves company or, you know, if, if I suffered, everyone else has to, or I don't like anyone else doing better in something that I did or whatever it may be. We need to be able to start calling these things out. And I think RSE, Relationship and Sexuality Education, which is standardized and um, across age appropriate, across all age levels, and mandatory um, is absolutely essential as a starting point. And we're not going to feel the benefits of that now. I don't think any of us will, but I think the, the women and girls come after us well. Uh, and that's really, really important. Um, but in general, I think with media, the sensationalizing, I presented evidence recently to one of the assembly committees about primary research we did in relation to stalking. And there were media outlets that made up interviews with me. I never had interviews with them as if I had in, done an interview with them. And the headline was, you know, like lobbyist warns paramilitaries against the threat to women with a photo of me and my name underneath, you know, that's dangerous. I don't know why they're doing that. All I was doing was showing anonymous survey results. Um, but in general as well, I think when we're talking about topics that impact women and they can be really triggering and upsetting for people, especially stuff around domestic and sexual violence, we need to stop putting people's experiences up for debate or their lived experience or even their right to exist up to debate. And I keep seeing this with people who are marginalized. You see it with disabled people, you see it with trans women, um, you see it with ethnic minorities over and over again. And we need to stop doing that because that's actively harming people. It's not just a topic up for debate. Um, it's not an opinion when it undermines someone's right to exist. So those are just some of my like main things, but I do think all media should also get training on these issues um, and other issues, including um, race, disability, sexuality and gender identity. Um, there's a wide range of work needs done here, but those are just some of the top parts, I think. Great. Thank you very much, Rachel. Linda, we'll go to you just to, for your reflections on that theme and also, you know, who's missing from the conversations at the moment? Who's not at the table? Yeah. Well, I think one of the things that comes across to me strongly that could improve things is, and I, I know a lot of people have said this before, about police and social media much better. And, you know, I think these big companies are making a lot of money. And yet, you know, there's no social responsibility whatsoever there. I mean, these are these are just pets, really, sometimes when people are allowed to be torn apart. And, you know, people's careers have been destroyed and, and that's not, you know, people have been threatened, all sorts of things. So I, I strongly feel that there should not be, um, you know, faceless, nameless people on social media that you have to register in some way so that you know if you go on there and you threaten people or you know you, you get up to whatever it is you're doing then you know there's some comeback on that 
Um, I think Rachel made a really good point, and I feel that strongly as also somebody who works for a charity, is I don't have any comeback, and there are people who can take people for libel. I have been libeled on numerous occasions. I can't do a thing about it. It's just open season for people to go in, say what they want, do what they want, to destroy you in any way they want. And it's only if you have money, position, power, that you have any comeback. And as Rachel made a really good point is, if I was a, an important politician, or you know I was an important person, they, that wouldn't happen. These people would be hunted down. But you know, if you're just doing your work, then that's okay. So I think that has to stop. I think we have to look legally. How do we protect people? on places like social media? You know, how do we make it a situation where, it, you know, it's just not for the rich because there's a very unequal um, situation here where people, ordinary people are not protected. Thank Can I just say really quickly on that, Linda, just about the online abuse. We did loads of work on this with our hate crime legislation review. And the, the guy who created the internet said the internet's failed women and it's just gonna keep upholding mm -hmm. violence against women. But one of the issues is because there's no accountability, they don't care if their names and addresses are attached. So that I know we talk about anonymous trolls a lot of the time, and there's loads of them, particularly on Twitter, but they're able to trace 98% of abuse towards women back to profiles, real people. Yeah. And there's no accountability for it at all. And I think that the, the idea that social media companies, whether they're American or they're, you know, they're based in the South, we need to have local legislation um, that deals with this. It's not just a Westminster issue either. We, we are a devolved place. We need to be able to make our own legislation on it. Definitely, the the because the focus that does tend to be a lot on anonymous people when in fact there's actual identifiable people who are engaged in this kind of misogyny and misinformation and just downright lies that are spread online. Some of which can put you at risk. You know, or your own safety is at risk because of of the things that people are saying. Linda, like I, like I know what you're saying. You are a very important person, but I get the point that you're making. Um, you have engagement with a, a wide variety of people, like in your experience of the people that you're working with and the people you talk to and what you observe for yourself, who's missing from the conversations? Who do we not hear from that we should be hearing from? Because I know that, um, you know, uh, we've heard from people who aren't the, from the traditional sort of green orange divide, people who have made their home here for a, a number of years and none of their uh, concerns or their needs are ever addressed really because we're too busy obsessing with the story of, of the North, the story of Northern Ireland, that has been the same story for decades now. I, I think that we miss the voice of the people who are just getting on with it. You know, the people who are positive, the people who want to make this place work. And I think sadly, um, you know, whenever you look at sort of social media or media, um, the people who shout very loudly, those negative voices are the ones who are heard and who make themselves heard. And the ordinary man in the street you know, doesn't want to speak up. They don't want to draw attention to themselves. You know, so they stay in the background. And it really frustrates me because if we take protests or you take riots or you take any situation, you'll maybe get a hundred, even a couple of hundred people out on the street, but you'll get thousands and thousands and thousands in their homes, doors shut saying, I don't want anything to do with this. So we don't hear the voices of the peaceful people. We don't hear the voices of the positive people. And that's, that's just the, the really sad thing. And then, you know, they are the majority. And I, I think Eileen made reference to this earlier. They are the majority, but, you know, they're unheard. Eileen, your thoughts on this theme? Yeah, I mean, I agree with everything that's been said. And I think they haven't left much to be said. But, you know, I mean, I had a conversation the other day. You know, if, I, if, if a car hits me that's a non-insured driver, somewhere for me to go to get compensated for my car being hit for a non-insured driver you know there there's there's there has to be a system put up to make it possible to, to go down that legal route because as rachel says we're all coming from community background uh, and foundry organizations who are very badly funded anyway so you know we we're, do, we're doing our work and, and doing the best that we can on on a shoestring budget that we have to look at on a yearly basis in most cases and and you know that doesn't doesn't help any shape or form that if we wanted to take a legal process uh, you know, we, we we wouldn't be able to do it. We wouldn't be able to to uh, manifest 
I sort of way would think that if we could get somebody who was maybe some student at a university or somebody who 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 can do a collective when these uh negative posts come on Twitter or Facebook and they actually have the job to go in there and contradict them and say you're wrong that's not what they said you know yeah and it's not necessarily even the person who's posting the negativity it's ever who's following him that I him or her that I would fear the most because if, if you're getting people's blood railed up you know, you the person who's doing that post is not even looking at what damage that could be done because they could have maybe 10 head cases following that who's be quite happy to come to your house and put a brick through your window or put a, a petrol bomb through your window or shoot through your window. So it's not necessarily the one that's actually doing the tweet. It's the followers of those tweeters. So you're maybe talking hundreds of people that you, you fear or a fear of them doing something. And that's where my fear is. And I have no redress of, of where it's a legitimate fear or not. I felt it. So the fact that I felt it, you know, I mean, was a legitimate enough for me. You, you know, once you get attacked on social media, make sure that front door's locked as soon as you come in the door. So, you know, I mean, your personal safety uh, you're, you're, you're supposed to be safe in your own home. I didn't feel that. So they have took away some of my own human rights, my civil rights by doing this. And I, I, I think and somebody attacks my rights of being able to live somewhere safe, then I should have redress. But there should be a pot of money there for me to be able to do it without mm -hmm. me having to having to finance. I couldn't financially do that. Our organizations that we work for financially couldn't do that. So, you know, it's a bit suck it up and, and, and continue on. But so it's like access to justice, access to remedies, access to accountability. Um, yeah. you know, has anybody else any final thoughts on that theme before we move on? Yeah, no, I very much agree with that way, Eileen, because, you know, and, and I, I don't mean any harm to any politician or, or any, um, you know, personality who has been able and in a position to be able to get redressed, but we can't. And if there was something set up, it would, it would you know, make these people think twice very much. You know, it would only need to happen two or three times and then they would say, oh, here, I have to be careful. But at the minute, as I said, it's just a free for all. You know, go in there, write anything you want about anybody you want, and you know, just totally lie, misrepresent, undermine, destroy them, and there you go, and that and that serves your purpose. It kind of feels as if though that the, it's, there's a, like a lawlessness to it. That there, there is. Uh, it's kind of it's it, it feels like I, I know that we're not the only jurisdiction that has this issue, but it does feel like an extension of our society that there is this kind of disregard for the rules to quite an extreme extent. Does that sound? Yeah, I think our laws in relation to this sort of abuse are totally out of date. Like everything that we have around like the Malicious Communications Act and, and all of the rest, most of these laws are in place from before social media existed. And now it's something that has just totally grown out of control and there's zero accountability for it. And you know that there's no accountability. So if people are seeing others getting reported all the time and nothing ever happening, um, they know they can get away with it because they're one of millions and billions of comments. Um, and it's just getting to the point now where it is out of control. And I think we need to be able to look at how women and young girls in particular are being so disproportionately impacted by this. Like I am genuinely so worried about young girls and some of the stories we heard about how boys are photoshopping their faces onto like naked bodies and, um, you know, basically blackmailing them and, and doing all these horrific things to them through social media. Like we urgently need to try and catch up with this before um, technological advancements harm women further. And for us in our jobs, I look at it like we're just working in the voluntary community sector for charities, trying to improve people's lives. If we worked in any other job, it wouldn't be accepted that we get this amount of abuse. Why do we get it now? Just because we're trying to improve things for other women who are being impacted by different issues. Like it's just unacceptable. And I really think that we need to update our legislation on this. There needs to be proper accountability and a process you can go to actually get justice for what's happening because the impact this has on you is long lasting. Like I have spent years getting sent the most horrific 
uh, images and threats in my private messaging. And I very much am like, oh, you know, it doesn't matter. Try and brush it off, but it does have an impact on you. Um, and it's so disheartening that that is what people spend more time doing towards you than actually recognizing the very valid points you're making about how like, people's lives could be improved. Just, just sorry there we met and just to say i don't do social media for that reason you know if i started doing social media because uh, i know rachel uses it and, 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 and elaine uses it and linda every now and again uses it but i don't use it i don't do it you know uh I, I don't read it. I, I, I try, and it's something that I learned when I was working up in, in the, the women's prison, trying to get women to resettled back into their communities again. Because of, well, if I had read the newspapers, then I was going in with a judgment where at least anything that I get, and I, I'm, I'm hearing it from real people, not, not from social media. So I don't do it, and, and I do that consciously. So I'm, I'm glad I don't. Because if it did, you know, I would probably be in a worse situation if I said the things that 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 I'm speaking with the people on a face to face issue. So you know, and it stops me from doing social media for one of those reasons that it, it can be judgmental to if something you were going to do something like reading the paper and you know, I mean, I, when I work with the women up in the prison, some of the stories that were in the newspaper. I just didn't know where they got them stories from. Uh, and I had to stop reading them because I didn't want it to share my judgment and go in with pre potential you know, thinking something that I had read that may be true. So, you know, and that's one of the reasons I don't do social media at all. Uh, uh, you know, I maybe read the odd one every now and again uh, when, when it's something to do with, you know, getting, getting, one step, two steps forward, only positive stuff that I would read. I don't really give them the time. I don't give them the time okay. of day because anything I say, I'm hearing it from real people, not from a, 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 a keyboard. Right. That's an interesting point, Eileen. Thank you. Eileen, you wanted to jump in there, I think, as well. Yeah, this relates to what Eileen and Rachel were just saying. Social media is easy for people to use in a kind of anonymous way. I was thinking of a job I had um, nearly 20 years ago where some of the time you would be sitting at a reception desk and the rest of the day you'd be sitting in the main open office and it was the reception desk duties were rotated between people and the rest of the time you'd be answering the phones. And I recall on my very first day, the person who trained me in saying, people will call up on the phone for a general inquiry, maybe they'll want to get through to somebody who has already told you I'm not available this morning, don't put any calls through to me. And the person on the phone will give you all sorts of abuse, thinking if they shouted you enough, you'll put them through just to get them off the phone. And that's true, it happened daily, right? But then that same person would come in for a meeting a week or so later, and you'd be on the reception desk. And they wouldn't recognize you, but you'd know them. And they would be the most charming, the nicest, you know, because they're like looking at your face. And the woman who trained us in said, when you're on the phone, and this is before the days of social media, whenever you're on the phone, you're not uh, engaging with them as a human being. They're just an, almost like a robot. Whereas when they walk in and they see your face, you're a human being. And even though they may not have a great deal of respect for the work you do, and they often didn't, they can't shout at you in the same kind of abusive way that they did on the phone without feeling bad about it. Social media removes that even one step further again. But at the same time, I, I'm wary of, of the idea. I, I can understand all the reasons why people take themselves away from social media for their own mental health and their own safety. But I don't think that should be a solution. Um, I think the, the solution has to be in fixing social media because as we do an awful lot of jobs that were simply impractical to do them without social media. And even apart from that, it, it almost feels a little bit like victim blaming to tell people just limit your time on social media and it'll be fine. And um, the problem lies with the root of it, which is, you know, back in, in that example about people shouting at, at, at um, people answering the phone. And um, it, it comes from this idea you can shout at people who are customer service uh, workers and uh, you can treat them poorly. You can treat service workers poorly generally. And then th in this instance, it relates to you can tell these you can call these women all sorts of things because they're just women talking about women's issues. They're not on my side. They're the enemy. And therefore I can say anything 
that pops into my head to say. It doesn't matter about the truth of it. It doesn't matter about the impact of it. I can just say and use anything. Um, and I feel safe because I'm on social media. So the problem has to be with rooting out, the solution has to be with rooting out those issues that caused that behavior in the first place. Because if they can't do it on social media, they'll do it some other way. They'll turn up at events that you're at and heckle you. They'll, you know, put a brick through your window if they have to. If we actually start addressing misogyny and, and the various other kinds of um, prejudices that relate to it, we might actually get somewhere. How do we do that, Elaine? I know it's a big question and I know we're not going to solve it right now, but is there anything that you can think of that can practical can, can start to help? And we'll come to you next, Linda, because I can see you're itching to talk again. Yeah. One thing that Rachel said earlier was RIC in schools. That's age appropriate and it's really, really thorough. I think that's a huge part of it because the people focus on the S part of RSE, but it's really about R, which is, you know, the relationships aspect. And relationships are all sorts of relationships, not just romantic ones. There are the relationships you have with colleagues, relationships you have with friends and, and family members and your neighbors and everything else. And having respect as a building block of that um, would go a long way towards uh, fixing this problem. And like Rachel said as well, that's a generations in the future thing. In the short term, what we can do is start talking about misogyny seriously. Like, don't dismiss it as um, as nothing at all. Uh, a little while ago, um, there was a discussion in the Republic of Ireland about whether or not uh, misogyny should be included in the categories of the hate crime law that they're bringing in soon. And this is something that we've worked on up here. So I got a phone call asking me to come on and talk about it. And I said, yeah, sure, I can do that. And then the researcher said to me, so what would that actually mean in practice to have misogyny as a hate crime? So I gave him like a line or two explaining, you know, sometimes it's, it's framed like you'd be locked up for telling jokes about your mother-in-law, right? That was an example I'd heard on the radio earlier that day, which is where I came from. And then I said, you know, that's not what it is at all. Misogyny is a totally different thing to making casually sexist, maybe a little bit dated 1970s style jokes. Um, nobody's going to be locked up for that. It's, it's a crime that's connected with the underlying motivation of hatred of women. And he lost interest immediately. They only want to talk about it if they can make it an easy thing to bait. And, and, I, and they said, we'll give you a call back in 15 minutes. I never heard from them again. It's that thing of like, they want it to be an easy set them up, knock them down thing. They want misogyny to be almost like a joke itself. And it's really not. So I think we, we need to do something in the media and elsewhere to talk about misogyny as a serious problem. And we had that horrific, attack over in in England in Plymouth um it was you know that person was so obviously um animated in everything he did by his underlying misogyny and just to even talk about misogyny as a serious motivator there it was you were immediately shut down and um, it was almost treated as no 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 look he had, he was a misogynist but let's look at what made him do this thing as if they couldn't be connected as if it's a brand new territory when it's been done over and over it's just that the conversation hasn't been had Okay, thank you. Uh, Linda, you wanted to say something? Yeah, no, well, it just basically um, Graham with what Elaine had said there, that the social media comments are not, you know, they're the symptom, they're not the cause. And I see it very much in my own job, and particularly recently with the, the, the kind of stuff around the, the new NISCO, that it's the way politicians, it's the way leadership, it's the way people in authority here talk about the Irish language that makes me vulnerable that makes me fair game for other people to be able to attack and criticize and think that it's okay to have a go at me because this is something that shouldn't be respected that is some sort of threat rather than what it is you know i'm somebody who does a really good job i'm my job's about reconciliation my job's about education and yet you know for some people because of how the media presents the irish language and that is the big issue here then i become somebody who is some sort of lundy traitor um, bringing about the downfall of Northern Ireland, you know. So, so I do again think there is responsibility um, with with the media for a lot of the ills that we have here in Northern Ireland society. Okay, okay, Rachel, you're not in there. Yeah, I would disagree, and I think you know how our politicians and and you know senior officials in Northern Ireland speak about women also just makes it seem like it's okay. You know, we've had so many different comments about being a wife and a mother first or trying to ban C-sections or, you know, forcing women to go through pregnancy when they have been sexually assaulted and all these horrific views. If that's coming from the most senior decision makers in our society and they can't even call that out, 
I don't think there's any hope of a change in it. I think the change itself is going to be bottom up, but that's not going to happen without having the people at the top willing to actually see that change. And a lot of the times what we're calling for and these changes in society that we're calling for, you know, the way that we're calling for these changes through education and, you know, bringing groups together and all of the rest. I think for some that can be applied to too many other topics. So they're reluctant to see any society change. They would rather our society stay segregated and apart and it's easier then to just do what they do. So I think in general, where we are now, people are so reluctant to even acknowledge when something is misogyny. Five women got stabbed last year and they couldn't even call that a misogynistic hate crime. Even when we were calling for misogyny to be recognized as a form of hate crime, the two main Equality and Human Rights Commissions here said, oh, but men and boys too. There's zero evidence anywhere of hate crimes happening to men and boys because they're men and boys. They happen for other reasons, such as, you know, they're, if they're an ethnic minority, their religious status, whatever it may be, it doesn't happen because they're men. But this does happen to women. There's so many different cases of it. And we live in a place where we can't recognize that without saying, oh, but what about them? We need to be able to just say what it is and recognize that and call it out. And sometimes things are worse for one group and that it's not OK that it's worse, but sometimes that's a fact. Um, so I think that would be a very good starting point if we could do that. And the other thing, too, that that the social media is uh, and over the last number of weeks is sectarian. You know, the, 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 it's an, a sectarian tool and, and things are being said that is sectarian. You know, when they say no green feet or no orange feet, that's sectarian. And the, the, that type of language is sectarian, you know, and, uh, and yet that's still being allowed to be put out on social media, you know, uh, and, you know, we, we don't get those reported cases of, of, of uh, you know, I mean, that there's people here being burnt out of their homes because they're from a different different country. And we get very little done about that too, because it's not fallen into orange and green. If that had been a Protestant or a Catholic that were burnt out, that would have been a completely different story. You know what I mean? There's sectarianism and there's racism and if you're if it's sectarian, you'll be called out. But if it's racism, your house is burnt down, your car's burnt down. That'll make the headlines one once. It'll make the headlines once, and then it'll die a death. You know, and and there's a lot of that happening on the ground, and a lot of people are are scared to speak out because of what will happen on social media and uh, in the headlines as well. Uh, it's just I just get so frustrated that. Your hands is tied, and I'm one of these people who like to go in with a sledgehammer and sort of try and fix things out. But, you know, and I learned to chip, 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 chip away, but no matter how much they've tried to chip, chip, chip away, you know, I'm I'm doing the type of work that I do, whether it's through the trade union movement or through community or foundry for the last 46 years, and I'm still chipping away. I'm still chipping away, you know, that we shouldn't have to in this day and age chip away for something that is our right, which is our right to have and be protected as as women, but be protected as, as part of civic society, uh, which, you know, if they looked into it and if they really listened and if they really understood, every good thing that happens to a woman, a man will benefit out of it. You know, so let's let's... You know I mean, think about things, not just as gender, but we need those improvements within gender to improve everybody's life, Eileen, not just women. If you were going to, you know, if you could wave a, a magic wand and maybe oh. there was like a list of maybe three things that you think would make everyone's lives better, would make women's lives better, what would you do? If you were in charge of, of, of this place and you could you could fix things, what would you do? I think we have to sort of look at our youth, you know, for the future, because we have to look for the future, because we've lived that past that I don't particularly want to live again or or want our, our young people to live again. And I think we need to invest, you, you know, the areas that I work in probably are, are, are the least uh, got a peace dividend and I don't mean peace dividend as in money, because sometimes money thrown at people doesn't cure 
the, the problem. It's a stick and plaster on an issue. And, and I would like to see industry come here that our young people are actually in industry together and working together, that they're not divided. You know, you know I mean, I, I came up and very lucky and worked in, in, in industry. I have a lot of Catholic friends and I met them in work and, and you work with those friends. I still work with those friends. I still go on holiday with those friends, you know, are respective. So I think we need to be looking at, you know, getting our young people into employment and, and employment where they will mix. The other thing I to, thing that doesn't be talked an awful lot about is shared housing. You know, I would say 85% of the people that I talk to and the 85% of the, the women that I work with all would live in a shared housing. All would live shared housing. You know, I, I, we need to concentrate. Integrated education is another thing. So there's there's three things that's possible. They're, they're very possible. They're not. They're yeah, not you don't need a magic wand for those. Not, like, this not is to the moon or anything. These are things, basic things. These are regeneration. These are, are, are making a future, a better future for everybody. Uh, 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 that our young people, our young people really don't have hope. I, you know, I mean, I see them hanging around the corner. I see them, they're, they're addicted to drugs or to their alcohol. And, but that's because there's no hope for them. If they had to get up to work in the morning, maybe they wouldn't be doing those other activities. Now, we have fantastic youth out there who are doing fantastic work. And those are the ones who will make it in society. But we are forgetting about those other ones that society has left behind. This is a society issue uh, and it's been caused by the, well, there has been the conflict or industry disappearing here. When you look at, we had the shipyards, we had the rope works, we had the docks, we had the shorts, we had uh, Shraka Works, we had Mackey's, you, all them big industries no longer exist. And we have three generations of people living in these working class areas who have never worked and never no, no ambition to work. But we need to start of not 16 years of age leaving school. We need to be looking at those 30 years of age who have never worked from the left school you know, and, and work your way back and, and give people a wee bit of hope that there is a future here in, in Northern Ireland uh, and they can raise their family and they can get their own wee house and they can, you know, uh, go out and do that. And the short housing industry and 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 looking, looking, looking just at, at, at the future uh, as if it's possible and not impossible because that's, that's the outlook that people have now. I, I always say, I always every time I speak to Eileen Weir, I always leave feeling radicalised in a good way. <laughs> I think that speech was, was part of that. Um, Linda, we'll go to you next then. Just if you had your magic wand, obviously you don't need a magic wand for the solutions, but what would your, what what like three things would make life better here? I think there's a number of things and I think Eileen's covered some of them. I'm obviously a big supporter of integrated education, but I also believe that we shouldn't be educating our teachers separately. So I would get all the teachers together and I would educate them together. You know, they would be doing their PGCE or their BAs in one central, one central point, in my opinion. Um, one of the things I think could maybe help, and I, I, I get very, very frustrated, as I'm sure a lot of people do, in that what we see here is a situation, whether it's racism, sectarianism, um, you know, just that intimidation of people where it just happens. Nobody's able to do anything about it. The police aren't able to deal with it. So there's two things I think that need to happen. I think we need to change our legislation to give the police more powers because quite often their hands are tied. But also I think we need to invest in law enforcement too because you know so many of the police stations are part-time, they're under they're understaffed. And you know, and the police are in an impossible situation. And I, I can see that. So I think if there was more investment there, more help, more recognition of, you know, what are the problems, you know, and speak to the actual police and say, well, if, you know, if you had more powers or you had more money, how could you help to sort these out? You know, would there be ways that you could go in? And that could be, you know, community education, the police going in and working and having better relationships with communities. So as these things don't erupt, you know, or that they know very quickly, you know, who's doing it. But it, it's very frustrating where the police know 
you know, we know so and so, and it's a scale, a small group of people who are causing these problems. And here's what they do when they intimidate others or, you know, um, put people out. They vilify whole areas. So other people look in and say, oh, my God, it's not a shocking place. Look at the way they treat people. No, they don't treat people like that. There's a couple of people who maybe don't even live in that area who have decided we don't want you to live there and we're going to put you out. So, as I say, more powers for the police, more money for the police to hopefully be able to deal with these issues and to stamp them out. Okay, and Rachel? I would rather there be like mass investment into tackling gender-based violence through community action. Like I, I think we need much better legislation in the first place. We need a way for people to actually hold people accountable for doing what they've done. At the minute, our laws are totally inadequate when it comes to all issues of gender-based violence. Um, so that would be like my first main one would be just addressing gender-based violence through listening to experts, developing a violence against women and girls strategy, adequate RSE, um, men hold, holding other men accountable. Why do we always have to be the ones doing it? I think that would be one aspect of it. My second one would be for, a, it's a bit more idealistic, I think, and you would need a magic wand for it, but it's total realignment of our economic structures. There needs to be recognition of the unpaid labor of women. Without this recognition and funding towards these industries, women will always face economic disadvantage. They will be forced to leave jobs, to stay at home for elder care, for disability care, for childcare. They then will also be forced into sectors that are led by women and because of that are vastly underfunded and underpaid. If you look at the care sector in Northern Ireland, it contributes over 4.6 billion a year to our economy. That is more than the majority of the budget that we have for this whole place. And the only reason we keep going is because of the unpaid labour of women. So I would love to see a total realignment of our economic structures where you have women economists brought in who aren't making these you know, assumptions like the Tory government do where it just totally neglects the fact that women are the one at home doing that and that doesn't matter when we're making our budgets. It does. Um, and then I think the next thing which relates to that and is my final thing will be on a mass women's employment strategy. Um, almost a third of all women in Northern Ireland aren't in the formal labour market. They aren't in paid labour. And the number one reason being is family, home, family and home commitments. But there are huge other reasons as well, um, such as gender discrimination and disability. I think if we had a proper women's employment strategy, we would be able to look at women from all different backgrounds and address the systemic barriers, whether that is disability discrimination, maternity and pregnancy discrimination, um, whether it's just blatant discrimination in the workplace around women's advancement. I think it's so crucial. If we had a third of any other group of people not in the labour market, you'd be looking at it and saying, oh, we need to do something about that. There's a disability employment strategy on its way. Why can we not develop a women's one? Because it's expected that women will keep doing this unpaid work. So my three main things then are economic realignment, uh, women's employment strategy and mass action on gender based violence. Very good. And Elaine? OK, so first of all, I was going to say exactly what Rachel said about gender based violence. It is an epidemic and we don't talk about it. We treat it like or we treat it even worse, I think. We treat it like there's a justice system there, trust the justice system, everything will be fine. When if you look at sexual violence, so few cases get anywhere within a mile of a courtroom. And when they do, it's exceptionally hard to get um, an actual conviction. And I know that work is being done on that through the Gillen Review and various things like that, but it's connected in with so many other things. So RSE would be an easy win for that. Um, it could be done at the will of the minister and um, it could be standardised and, and, and mandatory across all schools, all ages, age appropriate, overnight. Um, so RSC is a simple one, but that would be connected up with a, a violence against women and girls strategy, investment into those various different services that provide that. Northern Ireland had no rape crisis service. It was a dedicated rape crisis service for a very long time. Um, even at that, there is just something like the Brook Centre over in Antrim, the only one for the whole of Northern Ireland. What if you're in rural Fermanagh? What if you're in, you know, in a, in a domestic abuse situation, you can't get away? There's so many things that we are used to and that we've sucked up and accepted for because of the underinvestment in this place that would be shocking and appalling if it was happening in England or if it was happening in the Republic of Ireland. Uh, my sister works in a related sector in the Republic of Ireland and I can tell you she is shocked when I tell her some of the things that go on up here. Shocked. We've just gotten used to it. We've accepted underinvestment in all of these public services because they impact most dramatically and most obviously on women and on young people who have the least access to speak about it. My next thing would be integration, not just in education, but in housing and a massive public housing building program. 
um that would that is the single biggest barrier we're going to be or not barrier is the wrong word we're going to be looking at a huge uh fallout of generations of people who will never be able to afford to buy their own home mm. when they start reaching retirement age and that's about 25 30 years away minimum maximum sorry and it's going to get worse from there on out and uh, we need investment in public housing we need it like 10 years ago um but now is a good time to start um and it should be integrated it should be shared and that's integrated in every possible way and i'm i'm thinking of the obvious things like flags and emblems but i'm also thinking of you know is it connected up with good infrastructure um you know is it is it a kind of thing that where people genuinely feel safe no matter what community they're from um including more recent arrivals the third thing I will say is it's connected a little bit what Rachel was saying about women's employment strategy. I would say a community program um, that is designed to meet the needs of women, but it's also designed to meet the needs of more recent arrivals into this country who may not have English as a first language. It's designed to meet people working non-traditional jobs, non-traditional hours, and it's designed to not this, it's not focused in purely on getting people into employment. It's focused also on finding, helping people find their own way, because just getting somebody in the door, door of a job does not necessarily um, help that person reach fulfillment. And we should be asking for better than survival. We should be able to ask for fulfillment at this point in our um, in human evolution. I think we should be able to say, um, get people to give people access to community based education that will meet their not just their needs, but their wants as well. Um, so people can thrive instead of just survive. Brilliant. That's that's great. I think we're going to wrap up there. But before uh, we go, uh, I want to give you the, the opportunity to highlight uh, some of the work that you're doing or where people can find further reading online or what you, you would like them to to read or see or do or you know whatever, whatever you wanted to say. We'll start with you, um, Eileen. We'll go back to you. Is there is there anywhere any resources that people should be finding out about about the Shankle Women's Centre or anywhere else or any, any advice you have? Well, you know, I mean, again, you know, I mean, Facebook, anything that you you you, you want to know about Shankle Women's Centre, go in, into Facebook, type in my name and see my history. I don't have a problem with what I have done in the past and what I what I do now, uh, what my past has made me who I am today. So, you know, uh, if, if people want to get to know me, just go in, put my name, Google it. Uh, Put my name in, Google it, and if there's anything that anybody really wants to to, to approach me on a face to face basis, I'm quite willing to sit down with anybody who can be constructive uh, and uh, look at, at, at things that we're doing, you know, within the community sector. And and you could hear from now. You know, I mean, we just don't work grassroots. You know, we're all part of a movement. We're all part of working together to improve. So what Rachel and and and, and is doing with the lobbying is is a part of what's needed in that area. And the stuff that I'm doing on the ground is the housing, is the integrated education, is the jobs for the young people, but it all ties in, it all links. And I think, you know, it's about that cooperation with each other and within a vast range of skills and ability. Uh, and just to look at one section of the community, if you look at me, you're missing a whole lot. So when you're looking at, at, at looking at something, go in and, and look at what the women's movement, the women's sector, the women's groups, women who are doing the Irish language, women who are actually uh, working uh, at the interfaces at the weekend when nobody else is there, even the paid workers are not there and women are doing it. So it's about not just taking people for individuals, uh, but Find out the truth first before you open your mouth or get your, yourself into a keyboard. Uh, uh, and you need to be be honest and be truthful. And maybe we will have democracy someday. Thank you. Linda? Okay, well, I mean, I just like to promote our new classes. It'll be starting in September. <laughs> so if anybody's interested in learning Irish, give me a shout. Um, contact the Belfast Mission or you can find me on social media. Um, also, if you are interested in integrated Irish medium for your, your small preschool child, we actually, I think we have two places left. 
or if your child is younger than three and you want to get their name, I would advise if you have a wee baby there and you're interested in it, and they spell fast, get your name down now because places are filling very quickly. And again, you can contact me through a spell fast mission or on social media. Just, just before Rachel goes, I had Linda because of the negativity that social media had on the Irish language. I had Linda over with an information session with a group that I had in Shangle Women's Centre. And one of the women told me last week that she has signed her young kid up, her young baby, is only two years, not even two yet, uh, to, to, to go into the Irish speaking school. Uh, and it just shows you when you get the right information and don't listen to social media and, uh, and bring the information to the people, then you get results. Fantastic. Lovely. Lovely. Rachel? Um, yeah, so I have a women's sector lobbyist Twitter account. It's at WS Lobbyist NI, and that's where I post like most of the information about all different bits of work or research or events we're doing. Um, but I would really, if I could ask people to go anywhere, I'm going to send you to the by far the biggest piece of work that we've ever been involved in, and that is the Feminist Recovery Plan. Um, we had 36 policy experts from over 25 organizations across Northern Ireland come together to write this plan, and it is radical. Um, some of the steps are things that could be done overnight. Some of them re require long-term structural change, but I guarantee you, you would search any topic and you'll find that we've written something about it and it's evidence-led. All of it is evidence-led and backed up by women's lived experience. So um, if you go onto the WRDA website and look for feminist recovery plan, um, we have a whole page on it. And within that, we spent the last year doing webinars and events. You can look back at all of it. We've made short summaries of everything. We've sent it to every department. We've done short briefings. Um, we're not expecting anyone to read the full 300 plus page report, but there is um, a lot of information there and broke down into loads of different ways. So feminist recovery plan, honestly, I think it's the way forward. <laughs> okay, and Elaine? Sorry, I muted myself because my five-year-old was trying to um, come in. Uh, <laughs> I would also reiterate everything that the others have said, and I've also worked on the Feminist Recovery Plan too, but there's two things I'd like to point people to. The first is um, Raise Your Voice, which is a project that we work on against sexual harassment and sexual violence, um, not just in the workplace, but also in the, in the communities, in public spaces and so on. We have our own website, which is raiseyourvoice.community. And we have a Twitter and Instagram and a Facebook as well. Um, I can't remember all of those off the top of my head, but I know the Twitter is at Raise Your Voice NI, where your is spelled U R. Um, we do a lot of various different lobbying type things, but we also do public awareness things. And we've had public facing events, and all of those are recorded and on the website, so you can watch them and you can read about what we've been up to as well. And we do a lot of that work on fixing headlines. You know, what's wrong with this headline? What impression does it give, and so on. Um, separate to that, uh, we've done some work at, at WRDA in, in the time I've been there and before that on um, women's voices within peace building and um, good relations work. On our WRDA's website, we have a toolkit that I put together last year about uh, facilitating um, community relations work um, from a gendered perspective. And it's it's quite short. It's maybe about six or seven pages long, but it's like a practitioner's toolkit that people might find useful if they're looking to have these kinds of conversations. And um, there's also various reports uh, across a number of different projects over a number of different years that highlight really um, what it is that women uh, can, can contribute, have contributed and will contribute to peace building in Northern Ireland and beyond. Brilliant. That's great. On the, on the WRDA website. Happy days. Great. Um, women, thank you very much uh, for joining me today. Thank you to uh, Elaine, to Rachel, to Linda um, and to Eileen and for everybody who's watching this and for more, visit amanda.ie. Thank you. <laughs>